Um, let me turn to chapter three, where we lay out a blueprint for the future monetary and financial system that could usher in quite profound changes to what is feasible in many walks of economic life. And let me start by putting things into a broader context. Throughout history, innovations in monetary arrangements have coincided with new types of economic activity that have led to dramatic spurts of growth and development. An important innovation was the advent of money in the form of ledger entries overseen by trusted intermediaries, which allowed new financial instruments that bridge both the geographical distance involved in trade, as well as the timing gap between incurring costs and receiving payment. The growth in trade and commerce in the last 500 years is hard to imagine without these innovations. Now, these were paper ledgers for hundreds of years, but when paper ledgers gave way to electronic record keeping, the gains were more dramatic still. So what lies ahead in the evolution of the monetary system? What is the next big development? This year's annual economic report argues that the monetary system could be on the cusp of another major leap. The watchword is tokenization. Tokenization is more than just the digital representation of money and assets. Tokens integrate the records of an asset, normally found in a traditional database, with the rules and logic governing transfers. By doing so, tokenization introduces two important capabilities. First, enables the contingent performance of actions. And second, it enables composability where multiple actions can be bundled together into one executable package. Now, to understand what this all means, it's useful to start by considering how things work today. Our current system is essentially a collection of separate databases maintained by banks and other intermediaries. These intermediaries serve as account managers who are entrusted with maintaining an accurate record of ownership and transfers. The information is then linked by third-party messaging systems. And all this gives rise to the separation of messaging, reconciliation, <coughs> and settlement. Tokenization combines messaging, reconciliation, and settlement into one seamless operation. Now, this saves time and raises efficiency, but this is only a small part of the potential gains. The more important impact <laughs> comes through better allocation of resources and better risk sharing by resolving information and incentive problems. Tokenization can do this by facilitating the contingent performance of actions, where one party can undertake to do something conditional on something else being in place. The simplest case is when there are two reciprocal transactions where one side would like to transfer an asset on condition that the other side pays and vice versa. In this slide, Amalia, who is on the left, wants to buy a security from Bob here on the right, and Bob is happy to sell, and they have agreed on a price. Under the current system, the transactions are executed separately using a series of intermediaries as account managers. Tokenization means that any reciprocal transfers can be made to occur simultaneously, with one being a precondition for the other. The various steps involved can be combined into one seamless operation. And the continued performance of actions can involve more than two parties. In this example, Amalia would like to pay dollars to buy a security from Bob, but Bob wants to be paid in euros. In this case, the atomic settlement can encompass all three sides of the triangle shown on this slide. Bob transfers the security to Amalia, while a foreign exchange dealer receives dollars from Amalia and pays Bob in euros. 
It's worth emphasizing that the potential for a tokenized system is not limited to the incremental gains in speed and efficiency um, on what we do already, but instead, as Augustine said, opens up, opens the door to entirely new types of economic arrangements that do not happen today because uh, of the frictions that come from incentive and information problems. Now, the full potential will only become clear with time as developers come up with new use cases that eventually catch on. But there are examples of use cases that immediately come to mind as they are well-known problems that have defied easy solution in the current system. Take supply chain financing as a concrete example. In this slide, the buyer here on the left takes delivery of input from a supplier who in turn receives inputs from the upstream supplier here on the right. Now suppliers often need some upfront financing to cover expenses to pay workers and buy materials. But the downstream buyer might be unable or reluctant to pay the supplier the full amount of the invoice until the goods are delivered. And you can see the similarity between this example and the one between Amalia and Bob, trading a security. In the supply chain example, a loan from a bank to the supplier in the middle would be an obvious way to break the logjam. But the supplier is often an, uh, uh, an unknown entity, a small firm, possibly in another country. And the bank might worry about the creditworthiness of the supplier or even possible fraud in case the invoice is fake or the supplier pledges the same receivable to several lenders. A related problem is the lack of transparency among all the interested parties about where the shipment is and in what condition. These well-known information and incentive problems have held back supply chain finance, even when the economic rationale is clear. It is this kind of problem where, tokeni where tokenization really comes into its own. Tokenization has the potential to tackle these challenges by building on the contingent performance of actions, contingent both on the actions of others as well as the state of the world. For example, a bank could extend a loan through a smart contract that responds to real-time information on milestones being met along the way. For instance, it could release additional funds to the supplier or reduce interest payments, depending on GPS data on where the cargo is. Now, to be sure, tokenization efforts are already happening. Crypto and uh, decentralized finance, or DeFi, offer the glimpse of tokenization's promise. But crypto is a flawed system that cannot take on the mantle of the future monetary system. Outside crypto, private sector initiatives have explored the practical applications of tokenization for real world cases, but they've been hampered by the siloed nature of their initiatives and have been disconnected from other parts of the financial system. What these projects have lacked is a tokenized version of central bank money as the settlement asset. Having central bank money in tokenized form as a settlement asset in the same venue as other tokenized claims provides a firm foundation to the functionalities of tokenization. The smart contract can then refer to the means of settlement as well as the underlying claim that is being transferred. In this way, the foundation of trust provided by central bank money means that it can knit together all the key elements of the financial system. Now, tokenized forms of private money complement CBDCs and provide the primary means of payment for real and financial transactions. And there are two main candidates for this role, asset-backed stable coins and tokenized deposits. Both represent liabilities of the issuer, redeemable in the sovereign unit of account, but they differ in crucial respects on how they're transferred and hence in their suitability as the primary means of payment. Stable coins, in essence, represent a transferable claim on the issuer, 
similar to a digital bearer instrument. They're similar in spirit to the private banknotes that circulated during the free banking era, where private money, where private money circulated with the issuer's name printed on the note. So when you open your electronic money wallet on your phone, you would have a list of all your money balances with the name of the issuer next to the amount. They're all different versions of money. And because there is no single money, there is no singleness of money, which is the property that all forms of payment go through exactly at par. In this slide, Hero pays Bob and Maria. And by doing so, Bob and Maria acquire claims against the stablecoin issuer. The issuer has no say in the matter, even when Bob and Maria have not undergone Know Your Customer or KYC checks by the issuer. More fundamentally, stable coins are tradable and the prices will almost certainly deviate from par, even if it's only by a very small amount. The reasons could include uncertainties in liquidity, quality of the backing, or even higher order uncertainty over whether others harbor doubts. And an asset that has an exchange rate is not really money as such. Sometimes it's during the collapse of the crypto platform FTX last November, prices can deviate from par by large margins, as we see on this graph. In contrast, tokenized deposits offer a, differ offer a different approach that not only preserves the singleness of money, but enhances the advantages of the current two-tier monetary system. In this slide, Sven would like to make a payment to Maria, who is a customer of a different bank. Meanwhile, both banks hold CBDCs issued by the central bank. In this case, a payment is made by reducing Sven's holding of tokenized deposit as, at his bank and increasing the tokenized deposit holdings of Maria at her bank. And the payment is settled by transferring CBDCs from one bank to the other. So unlike a stable coin, Maria does not wake up and find another bank's money in her wallet. She has simply increased her holdings of deposits at her own bank. Most importantly, since the value transfer is done using central bank money, the payment goes, the payment goes through exactly at par. In this way, tokenized deposits preserve the singleness of money, and the, the receiver uh, of the payment does not acquire a claim against um, the sender's bank. And so KYC rules are satisfied too, helping to uphold the integrity of the monetary system. The potential of tokenization is to knit together transactions and operations that encompass money and a range of other claims. How can we effectively integrate these elements? One approach is to adopt incremental changes to existing systems, for example, by interlinking them through application programming interfaces or APIs. And this could certainly yield benefits by mimicking some of the functionalities of tokenization. But history teaches us that relying solely on incremental fixes piled upon legacy systems has its limitations. Sometimes a more fundamental rethink is required towards a new financial market infrastructure. And tokenization represents one such opportunity. What is needed is to bring together tokenized deposits, other tokenized assets, with central bank money in tokenized form and bring all these elements together on a shared programmable platform. Each platform would only involve the assets and money required for the specific use case. So there would be more than one such platform designed for each particular use case. In this year's BIS annual economic report, we explain how a new financial market infrastructure called a unified ledger can bring the necessary elements together. The term unified ledger 
refers to the fact that several types of tokens are brought onto the same platform. We would certainly uh, envisage more than one such unified ledger, each associated with uh, a particular use case. Now, there are several elements of such a unified ledger, so let's go through them one by one. First, we need a monetary unit of account and settlement finality. And this can only be provided by the central bank. So a unified ledger features central bank digital currency in tokenized form as a core component. Alongside CBDCs, tokenized deposits provide the primary means of payment for real and financial transactions. And beyond money, a unified ledger could feature tokenized forms of financial and real assets, such as tokenized government securities, or even tokenized forms of real assets, such as commodities or real estate. The data environment that contains these elements also encompasses the information necessary for triggering any contingent performance of actions. For instance, in the supply chain example we saw earlier, the ledger could incorporate GPS tracking data, ensuring full information and transparency among all the interested parties in the supply chain. And any operation involving one or more of these elements is carried out in the execution environment. As mentioned already, each unified, ledger involves in, uh, each unified ledger involves only the intermediaries and assets required for that particular use case. For example, a payment between two individuals would bring together the, the user's banks as providers of tokenized deposits and the central bank as providers of CBDCs. Now, for the unified ledger to be a practical proposition, it has to meet the higher standards of data confidentiality and cyber, and cyber resilience. Data partitions ensure that information is accessible only to the respective authorized parties within their partition domain. And, me, uh, and meanwhile, cryptographic techniques facilitate the confidential sharing of data. Not least, a unified ledger needs a common governance framework defining the rules and standards on the interactions among the different components and how the rule book can be amended. As a new type of financial market infrastructure, the principles for financial market infrastructures, or the PFMI, would serve as a natural starting point for establishing standards and ensuring effective governance. So let me conclude. I have outlined a blueprint for a new type of financial market infrastructure, a unified ledger that integrates CBDCs, tokenized deposits, and other tokenized claims on financial and real assets. Such a system not only improves existing processes, but also unlocks entirely new types of economic arrangements and in this way, it can, in, it can improve the old and enable the new. There are many possible use cases, but the full potential of the unified ledger will only become apparent uh, with time as developers build on the platform. And here we can reflect on the experience from our own daily lives. We have all become accustomed to the seamless operation of apps on our smartphones. In many ways, the impact of smartphone apps on people's daily lives has far exceeded the, expect, uh, the initial imagination of the builders of the platform. The same is surely true of what is possible with tokenization and the unified ledger in unlocking entirely new types of economic arrangements. So in this respect, what I've presented to you today is likely just the tip of the iceberg of what is possible.